Hi. So, uh, I'm live now, I guess. Um, we're going to talk about chapter 1.1, Griffith's e &M. Um We're going to start with the advertisement, or advertisement, however you want to say it. Um, let's dive right in. So, he starts the textbook trying to explain what is electrodynamics, and how does it fit into the general scheme of physics. So, there's four realms of mechanics, um, how things move and describing their um, interactions. Classroom mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, special relativity, and quantum field theory. So um, electricity and magnetism is one of the classical uh, physics, um, but it can be extended to uh, quantum physics, to quantum field theory, quantized um, rather readily. Um, so Newtonian ma mechanics of the four, Newtonian mechanics is great for everyday life, um, but it had to be extended by Einstein's special relativity um, when we started trying to model things that move really fast. And then it had to further be extended when we went to really small objects um, with the theory of quantum mechanics. Um, if you have something that's very small and moving very fast, you had to uh, create a new theory that was called, or is called, quantum field theory. And that's the combination of really small things moving at very high speeds. Um, this book uh, exclusively studies the classical uh, regime of electricity and magnetism. Uh, electricity and magnetism can be extended um, pretty readily into special relativity and quantum field theory, um, but this is not the domain of this book. So there's four forces, four fundamental forces, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. That's only four. You may be asking yourself, what about friction? What about the normal force? What about um, chemical forces? What about all these other forces? Um, and all those other forces are actually electromagnetic at their root. Um, virtually every force in everyday life, except for gravity, is electromagnetic at the core. Um, every force that we experience uh, in a regular basis. The strong force um, is what keeps gluons, uh, quarks together using gluons, um, holding protons and neutrons together. So we don't notice that force because it has such a short range and it only does that um, activity. The weak force also has a very short range, W and Z bosons, um, and is responsible for radioactive decay and things like that. So we just don't notice those things on, uh, on in everyday uh, forces. So what about gravity? Gravity is so weak. If you calculate Coulomb's law, the force between two electrons, that force is 10 to the 40 times stronger than Newton's gravitational force, um, the masses of the electrons together. So the electrons will repel each other um, way stronger than gravity will hold them together. So we don't really see gravity uh, on the fundamental interactions either because the electrical force repulsion between electrons is way stronger than gravity. So the theory of electrodynamics then is a complete and th successful theory, and it's the only uh, one uh, of the fundamental forces which is complete so far. And the laws of classical physics, uh, classical electrodynamics, <coughs> were discovered uh, by Franklin, Coulomb, Ampere, Faraday, but it was James Clerk Maxwell who put everything together into um, the theory of electrodynamics. And... Uh, we put it all together. So that's the, the realm of this book is uh, what James Clerk Maxwell kind of did and we, we are just looking at what they all came up with and how they put it together. So electricity and magnetism were once separate theories and subjects. In 1820, Orsted noticed that um, an electric current could deflect a magnetic compass needle and that was interesting. And then Faraday noticed that a moving magnet could generate an electric current. So Maxwell and Lorentz put this all together into the theory of electromagnetism, which combined the two uh, topics together. Obviously, we're glossing over a lot of details here, but... Uh, Faraday speculated that light was electrical in nature. Maxwell's theory justified this, and optics was incorporated into e &M. And then Hertz said that the connection between light and electricity is now established. In every flame, in every luminous particle, we see an electrical process. Thus, the domain of electricity extends over the whole of nature. Um, it even affects ourselves intimately. We perceive um, that we possess an electrical organ, uh, the eye. So our eye uh, detects the electrical um, things. So by the electrical pulses, I guess. 
By 1900, then, the three branches of physics had merged into one. Electricity, magnetism, and optics were combined um, into a single theory of electrical uh, electromagnetism. Uh, Einstein tried to unify gravity with electrodynamics, but um, he was not able to, uh, nobody has done it so far. Uh, we, in this attempt to unify forces, we have unified some of the other forces. For example, Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam, they unified electricity and magnetism with the weak interaction, uh, which is called electroweak theory. And what this means to unify a theory just means that um, you can uh, calculate interactions between weak forces and electricity and magnetism, they show up in the same uh, equation. Um, so there are non-zero contributions from one into the other, uh, into uh, calculating the probability for an event to occur. So that's what it means to unify a force or a, 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 an interaction. So of course there is the elusive string theory, I call it a theory because it has not yet been proven or uh, demonstrated to have any predictions that um, could be verified by experiment. Uh, so uh, I don't mean proven because you can't prove something, but um, it, it cannot be, it has not been experimentally uh, tested yet. There have been no predictions that we could verify. But string theory claims to have the ability someday maybe to unify all four forces together. Um, so that's the goal though right now is to unify all the forces together and uh, those are some examples of unifications. Okay, so the fundamental problem of electricity and magnetism, what we're going to look at through this whole book, is to solve uh, this problem. Let's say you have a bunch of electric char uh, charges, and you shake them, or, it, or even they're just sitting there. What would happen to another charge over here? What happens in response? So what's the cause and effect between doing something here with charges and what happens to charges over there? Um, the solution to this, the classical solution, is what's called a field theory. So we say that the um, space around a charge is permeated by electric and magnetic fields, and we call this the electromagnetic odor of a charge, or we don't, but Griffiths uh, does. Um, the second charge then experiences a force, which is transmitted by the field from the original charge. Uh, we call this mediating the interaction. Um, when a charge accelerates, a portion of the field detaches, in a sense, travels off at the speed of light, that is called electromagnetic radiation. It's as every bit as real as a baseball or an atom. Um, the electromagnetic radiation that leaves has momentum um, and energy, and it can knock into stuff, cause electrons to get excited and so on. So it takes a charge to produce a field and then another charge to detect one. Um, so we have to understand the properties of a charge at this point um, to, to get to understand these fields. So, what is electric charge? It comes in two flavors, plus and minus. Um, there are equal, uh, or if you have equal amounts of plus and minus charge, they cancel each other out. Um, he says in the book, well, this might seem a little trivial to think about, but what if there were three or four flavors of charge? What if instead of plus and minus, there was plus, minus, and super minus, and super plus? There could very well be. The fact that there's just one plus and one minus is uh, very interesting. So what if there were, uh, or sorry, in Quantum chromodynamics, for example, quarks come in three charges, red, green, and blue. Uh, that's three charges. So that's an example of it's possible to have not just two charges, but three or more. Um, so in our understanding of what keeps um, protons and neutrons a thing is three quarks in there with fractional charge that all add up, and they have uh, red, green, and blue charges. So it's really interesting to have more than one more than two types of charge. Okay, so in uh, bulk matter, there are exactly, so anyway, forget about QCD and three charges, all we're gonna care about is that there's plus and minus, okay? So in bulk matter, which is like, you know, a capacitor or your arm or something, there are exactly equal amounts of plus and minus charges, so the net effect generally cancels out completely. If there weren't, the potato could potentially explode with the difference of, um, if there were too many plus charges, for example, they would want to be apart from each other and the electrical forces are very strong. Okay, so that's electric charge. Charge is also always conserved. It cannot be created or destroyed. What is, What there is right now has always been. There are two types of charge. Conservation, which is global and local conservation. Global char uh, conservation is the principle that, you know, you could take a plus charge, take it out of New York, and have it reappear in LA. So, you, so there, you took one away, you put it here, but there was always 
plus one plus charge moving around. That's global conservation. Um, we generally require both in E and M, global and local. Local uh, conservation requires that the charge couldn't just disappear and reappear. It would have to move from one spot to another. Um, and the way you conserve charge uh, from one point to another point is using something called a continuity equation, and we will study that at some point. Um, so charge is quantized. Uh, that's the next property of charge. This means that in classical electricity and magnetism, uh, it requires the math, or so nothing in classical electromagnetism requires charge to be quantized. The fact that it is is just the way it is. Um, the math does not require it, but it is quantized. So, for example, you can have one fundamental charge, ten fundamental charges, six, but you cannot have 6.1. Okay, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, those are the properties of charges that we're going to use base on. So the last thing here is units. So you got three types of units here, Gaussian, SI, and Heaviside Lorentz. Um, so Gaussian units, um, the primary units are centimeters, grams, and seconds. In uh, SI units, it's meters, kilogram, and seconds. And the Heaviside Lorentz is uh, a little bit different. Um, in this book, we use SI. So the different units give you different um, units. So for example, uh, in Gaussian units, this is what Coulomb's law looks like. In SI units, this is what Coulomb's law looks like. And in Heaviside Lorentz, this is what Coulomb's law looks like. So Coulomb's law for us, you're always going to have this 1 over 4 pi epsilon not showing up, or an epsilon not and a mu not showing up to make the units work. Um, so just be aware that, you know, depending on what you end up doing for your life or a book you try to read, you might encounter different units, but it's literally just different units, so you can just convert uh, between them. Okay, next thing. Let's move on. Chapter one, we review vectors, okay? Vector analysis. Um, so we'll start by reviewing vector algebra. Um, we're gonna talk about vector operations, uh, the component form of vectors, triple products, position displacement, separation vectors, and actually we're gonna skip how vectors transform. It's not necessary for what we do in this class, uh, but you might be interested in it, so feel free to read that section um, or study it. Okay, so vector operations. Let's say you walk four miles north and then three miles east. You traveled seven miles. You walked four, then three, so you traveled seven miles, right? Four plus three is seven. So far, E and M is really hard, right? Okay, you're not seven miles from where you started, even though you traveled seven miles. Okay, so how do you do this? We study our eventual location in our coordinate system with what's called a displacement vector, right? Because um, you are this far away and this direction from where you started. So we can talk about how far we traveled and also we can talk about where we ended up. But those are two different things. In Griffith's book, instead of having an arrow over it, um, he writes vectors in a bold font. So you, uh, in my lecture slides, you might have to keep track of uh, what, whether I'm talking about a vector or a scalar because it might not be obvious, so just be paying attention to that. And what's different about a vector than a scalar, a vector has magnitude and direction, a scalar is just a number. Okay, so those are slightly different because um, you care about the direction when you're talking about a vector, whereas you don't care about uh, in a scalar. So if this is vector a, then this is vector minus a. We can create a vector that's exactly the same as vector a, same magnitude, but opposite in direction, then it's just minus a. So these are just things, right? So there are four vector operations that you need to know cold, okay? You need to know these really well, and these are um, vector addition and then invent and multiplication with scalars. With vectors, there's three types of multiplication, three ways you can multiply um, vectors together, and we're going to talk about uh, what those are. So if you take a vector, you can lengthen or shorten it. You can multiply by a scalar. Or you can dot two vectors together. Or you can cross two vectors together. So we're going to talk about multiplication by a scalar, dot product, and cross product. So to add vectors together, um, uh, my slides are not working. Uh, oh dear. Really? I think my keynote just crashed. This is this is not good. 
Oh dear. My whole iPad's destroyed. Wakey wakey. Keynote, come on. What's up with that? Sorry, everybody. Whoa. That was very strange. I am very sorry for that. Um, okay, so there's to add vectors together you can use the head to tail method. So that means if you have a vector like this one and you have a vector like this one, then you can take the head of this vector and you can meet it with the tail of that vector. And if you do that, then the result of adding them together is this new vector C. And it's just connect the uh, tail of A to the head of B after you put them together. And that's it. So that's the head to tail method. Let's say I push on a falling object. So this is an example of adding vectors together. What will the net force vector look like? So you've got, let's say you dropped a birthday cake and gravity starts to pull it down. You go to grab it, but instead of grabbing it, you actually spike it to the ground even more. So you push on it with this vector. What's going to happen to it? Obviously, it's going to move in that direction somehow. So we want to calculate the net force vector. Where will this the net effect of this work? So those are the two vectors I um, applied to it, gravity and the push force. And then we do a head to tail. And so our net um, vector is going to be right from this tail to that head. Um, that's going to be the net vector. And if we calculated the length of that, that would be our force. And then F equals MA. So that would be also be the direction of our acceleration. And that would be where the um, cake would end up going after that uh, push. OK, so three types of multiplication. If we want to multiply a vector by a scalar, um, there's a couple properties here. You've got one vector v and one vector b. If you multiply, you know, you want to add them together, uh, multiply by a scalar, it's distributive. It'll a times v plus a times b. It doesn't matter whether you add the vectors first, then multiply them, or multiply each of them, and then add them. It's the same thing. This is what happens when you multiply a vector by a scalar. It just gets longer. Uh, the dot product, a dot b, is uh, a scalar. It just gives you a number, and the amount that a dot b is is the magnitude a times the magnitude b times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So if you have one vector a and one vector b, and they're separated by this angle theta, then the dot product is just defined as the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of theta. Um, the cross product, a cross b, is not a scalar, it's a new vector. And the result, uh, a cross b, is equal to an amount, a times b, times the sine of the angle between them. But then the result of this, the magnitude, is a vector that points in the direction normal to a cross b. So you might remember this right hand rule. So if you have a cross b, and that creates a plane because you have two vectors, and a cross b, the result is going to be uh, a third vector that's perpendicular to the plane generated by a and b. Okay, uh, a cross a is nothing. It gives you zero. There's no, um, if the two vectors are lined up as you uh, bring the two vectors close together, um, your third vector goes to zero. So a cross a uh, is zero. Um, a cross b is the um, the magnitude a b sine theta is actually equal to this area uh, created by the, it's a parallelogram generated by the two vectors a and b. And then the result a cross b, the length of this arrow um, is equal to the magnitude of this area. And then the direction is either uh, down from a b from the a b plane or up from the a b plane and that uh, is determined by the right hand rule so if you do a cross b then um, the result is pointed in that direction if you do b uh, cross a uh, you do it that direction but then if you uh, if you flip them to do it in the opposite direction so uh, b so you're gonna uh, how do I put my hands on my iPad? <laughs> okay, so if I do B, put my hand in the direction of the vector B, and then I rotate it into A, so B cross A, that's the same as doing B cross A, uh, 
uh, B cross A, and then the result of that is perpendicular. But if I do A cross into B, I point in the direction of A, and then I move in the direction of B, uh, now my uh, A cross B is down. So I have A, A cross B is pointed down, and then B cross A is pointed up. So B, B cross A is pointed up. A cross B is pointed down. It just has to do with the which one's first. You put your fingers in that direction, then rotate into the next vector, and with whichever one you're rotating, you always want to rotate like that. Okay, so that's the right-hand rule there. So the cross product, what is it? It's the area um, of these two vectors, and then pointed in a direction perpendicular to that plane. An example of this, other than math, is the physics equation, um, the Lorentz force, uh, v cross b, which says if a particle is moving in this direction, um, v cross b gives a force up, and you've got a magnetic field pointing into the iPad screen or into your screen. Then the force will experience, so you're going to have a particle coming in, and it's going to feel a force that's going to uh, push it up. Okay, uh, So we're going to calculate this eventually too. Okay, so component form. So those are the, you've probably done those dot products before and maybe those cross products before. Um, but now we're going to do them in a little bit more sophisticated way. So let's say you have a vector. Um, and the first thing you need to do is define a coordinate system so you can communicate your results. Um, what happens if we change the coordinate system? Okay, what happens to the vector? Do we change the vector? No, we don't change the vector. We just change the coordinate system that the vector is in. The vector didn't get longer or shorter, but the amount that it was in the x direction might have changed and the y direction changed and the z direction changed. So what we care about then are the um, components of the vector in the coordinate system we're in. So we have a vector which is a real thing and then we have a coordinate system which is a you know whatever we want it to be. So we have to define the vector in terms of the coordinate system that we create. So um, it sounds a little bit weird, but we have to decompose the vector. Okay, we have to bury it in the yard and watch what happens. No. Um, we have to decompose the vector into its components. Um, this is called vector decomposition. So it's like leaving mayonnaise out of the fridge. Okay, we have to decompose the vector in the coordinate system that we are in. So what does that mean? So there's our vector, and it's got an x and a y and a z. Uh, component. That's how we define the tip of this vector, where it is. So we have to break it up um, into three separate vectors. An amount in the x direction, an amount in the y direction, and an amount in the z direction. These vectors um, allow us to define an amount in the x direction, an amount in the z direction, and an amount in the y direction. So they just tell us what direction and what amount something is in. Um, in three dimensions, you need three unit vectors to, quote, span the space. And what does spanning the space mean? It just means that you can define a vector in that space with those three numbers. Okay? And you completely define anything that could exist in that space um, can be defined or explained with three components. So we call them unit vectors because they are of length 1, um, and they just point. So uh, some of the ways we can define this is, for example, the x hat vector might look like 1, 0, 0. And that just means it has length 1 and it only points in the x direction because um, this is the x and that's the y and that's the z representation. That's just a way we can represent um, that vector. Or we can say the y vector is 0, 1, 0. That's another way we can write it. Uh, or we can write any vector uh, as uh, having some x component plus some y component plus some z component. So these are all ways to just write. It's just a language, and that language just represents a mathematical idea. So, for example, this vector might have, you might have to go 2 in the x direction, 3 in the y direction, and then 5 up in the z direction. And that's how you would define this vector. So our next job is to take our unit vector and multiply it by a magnitude to stretch out the components to be the right components and that will match out the vector we have. So this vector, the way we would write it, okay, is um, 2x hat plus 3y hat plus 5z hat. And all that means is go 2 units in the x direction, go 3 units in the y direction, and go 5 units in the z direction. 
So 2, 3, and then 5. And that is how we write a vector in component form. Okay, now notice if we just, um, oops, if we just rotate our uh, coordinate system, move, notice how the components change, but the vector doesn't. So now we have different components because we're in a different coordinate system. The x got shorter, the y got longer, the z got shorter. The key thing that has to be maintained in this is that the length of the vector stays the same length. So if this vector v was, um, well, let's go back here. If this vector was 2 plus 3 plus y, the magnitude of that vector, the length of that vector, um, would be 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared, and then square root that. And that would be the length of that vector. The length of that vector is uh, unchanging in as we change our coordinate system. So whatever that number is, that's the length of that vector. If we go to a new coordinate system, the x component and the y component and the z component are going to be different. But the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared, the magnitude of them, square root, is going to be the same number. You might increase the x component and decrease the y component, for example, but in an amount so that the uh, overall length of the original vector does not change. So if you want to add two vectors together, instead of doing the head-to-tail method, um, you can say a plus b. Let's rewrite a and b in component form um, so that a vector is just um, some x amount in the x direction plus some y amount in the y direction plus some z amount in the z direction. So the vector a, right, okay, would have some x, y, and z components. And that's how we describe A. We say it's this long in the x direction, and that long in the y direction, and that long in the z direction. And that's how we write a vector. And we can do the same thing with B. So then if we want to add A and B together, then all we do is add like components. So how much in A plus how much in B? How much in Y plus how much in B? How much in Z plus how much in B? A and B add it together. And the result of AX plus BX is still in the x direction, so we just add the components uh, together, and that gives us a new vector. So, for example, what's the difference between this vector and that vector? Okay, nothing. Nothing is different. The vector is the same. Um, the only thing we changed was the coordinate system. So let's decompose our vector. So this vector v has a y component that we can write as v sub y, and it's got an x component that we can call v sub x. Um, if we want to add these two vectors together, v1 plus v2, we can do the head-to-tail method, and the result of this will be that vector. So we hope that v1 plus v2 gives us that. We define our coordinate system. Now we decompose the vectors into v1x and v1y and v2x and v2y. Um, so that this is v1x, this is v1y, this is v2x, and that's v2y. Okay, those are the components of them. Uh, next. We want to add them together, so we can add v1x plus v2x, and then v1y and v2y, and our new vector new, 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 is that in the x direction and that in the y direction, so we can write it as x hat and y hat, okay? So, um, continuing on here, add those components up. Okay, new vector is there, um, and now if we want to do the dot product, a dot b, what is that? We write our vector a as ax x hat plus ay y hat plus az z hat. Hopefully this makes sense to you, and this represents just some three-dimensional vector a with components ax, ay, and az. And the length of that vector would be ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared, square root. So we can write a and b as two vectors, and if we want to do the dot products, we do ax x hat dotted into bx x hat axx hat dotted into byy hat, axx hat dotted into bz z hat. Okay, we know um, from doing this that uh, the uh, ax, the x hat dotted into y hat, um, they're perpendicular to each other, so you get zero. Um, so the only surviving components are x dot into x. So um, so you'd get ax x hat dotted into bx x hat x hat dot x hat, so this is the vector, ax and bx are scalars, okay, so they're not actual vectors, so if I 
write this a little bit more neatly. Um, a x x hat dotted into b x x hat. So that's this times that. That's the first term in our uh, equation. This is the same as a x times b x, and then we move the vector over. So we have x hat dotted in x hat dotted in x hat dotted into x hat. Now x hat x hat dotted into x hat is 1. So then you just have ax bx. So then you get ax bx plus ay by plus az bz as the result when you do all the dot products. Um, and so remember that uh, the dot product a dot b is ab cosine theta. And so the angle between them, if the angle between the x component and the y component is 90 degrees, um, what's the cosine of 90? Okay, and so that, that's why those components disappear. All right, um, the third uh, multiplication is a cross b, and this is equal to ax x hat plus ay y hat plus az z hat, crossed into a uh, to b and so on. So we write our vector again, write our vector again, but now we're crossing it, okay? What does crossing mean? We're gonna do ax, uh, this is gonna become ax, the x component of a, x hat direction, and then it's gonna be crossed into b x x hat. Okay, well what is a x, uh, what is x hat cross x hat? Um, now this is the opposite. Instead of x hat dot x hat being one, x hat cross x hat is zero. And so that component goes away. And we have this list down here in uh, Griffith's book that x cross x is equal to y cross y is equal to z cross z. That always gives you zero because that's going to be um, x sine theta, and so uh, x x sine theta, and the angle between sine between x and x is zero degrees, so sine of zero is zero, um, and that always gives you that. Now x cross y, if you put your hands in the x direction and you cross into y direction, x cross y gives you z. Okay, so that's the result of that, and so you have x cross y equals z. Um, so when you multiply all this out, you end up getting that um, this times that gives you zero. So if I just write out this first term, a x x hat uh, crossed b x x hat zero, and then plus our next term is a x x hat uh, crossed into b y y hat. Okay, well what is that? It's a x b y, but then what's x cross y? x cross y is z, so then this is the magnitude ax times the magnitude by in the direction of z hat. And so there's that term there at the end uh, on the z hat uh, component. So if, if you do all of that, if you work all that out, um, you get all of the, the x hat dotted across in the x hat terms give you zero. So what survives are these. Um, and this is what a cross b is. You gotta figure out all the magnitudes and that's what remains in the x hat direction. Okay, and remember what a cross b is, it's the area of that parallelogram um, defined by a and vector a and b. And this is how you calculate that area. Um, the other way you can uh, uh, remember what the cross product is instead of trying to redo it every time, you, you, it takes a long time and a lot of work, is the determinant of this matrix. So these lines mean the determinant of the matrix. So you have i, j, k. Your first row uh, is the unit vector, i, j, k. And then the next row is your first vector, a, the components of it, x, y, and z. And then uh, the third one is the components of b. And the result of this is um, this matrix, or this result is the determinant of this submatrix in the i hat direction, and then that one in the j direction, and this one in the k direction. Um, so what is that? This is a2, oops, a2b3 minus b2a3 in the x hat direction. x hat is the same as i hat, uh, and then minus, and then the result of this, a1b3 minus b1a3, and so on. So that's one way to remember um, the cross product is by taking the determinant of that matrix, okay? So, uh, triple products. So since the cross product of two vectors is a vector, a cross b is some new vector, c, uh, it can be dotted or crossed with a third vector. 
and that's what call, is called a triple product. So you can do A dot B cross C or A cross B cross C. Um, the, remember a dot product with a vector, so B cross C is some new vector. This is a new vector, and then A dotted, that vector, is a scalar, so we call that a scalar triple product, and then when you have a vector B cross C giving you a vector, and then you do A cross that vector, you get another vector, so that's the vector triple product. Um, the scalar triple product is A dotted into B cross C. You could write it that way. What is that? It's the area B cross C is the area of that parallelogram, and the result of it is a vector that points uh, in that direction, normal to that plane, and then if you dot that into A, it gives you the volume of this um, shape, okay? Um, that's what you can think of the scalar triple, uh, scribble, <laughs> the scalar triple product as. And A dotted into B cross C is the same as B dotted into C cross A and the same as C dotted into A cross B because um, this area times that height is the volume or this area times that height is the volume and so on. So those are all equivalent statements. Now, in this case, you have A, B, C, and A, B, C, and A, B, C, so the alphabetical order is preserved. Those are all equivalent to each other. If you flip something around, so you have B dotted into A cross C, you're going to get a minus sign in there, which is opposite, because that's going to correspond to um, some volume in the opposite uh, direction, or down, the end will be down, or something like that. Okay, so the vector triple product, A cross B cross C, can be simplified. You don't want to ever really do this, A cross B cross C. Now, that's a lot of work to do three uh, cross products in a row. So we simplify it with what's called the back cab rule. Um, so you can write A cross B cross C as B A C back minus C A B. Okay, what does that mean? It means A dot C is a scalar, and you can multiply that scalar to the vector B and then minus c, that vector times the scalar a dot b, okay? Um, that's a simplification. And you want to do that all the time because doing that is a whole lot easier than doing cross products. You don't have to take any determinants of any matrices or remember all that stuff and do all these little algebra things. So anytime you can get rid of a cross product um, is good. So a cross b cross c is not the same as a cross b cross c with these parentheses. So it's not associative, so you have to be careful with that. Write that down. All higher vector products can be simplified by repeatedly applying the back cab rule to reduce it down so that you only have to do one cross product. That's a really important thing. Um, and that's here where he says that, and he's got a couple of um, uh, examples here of A cross B dotted into C cross D, for example, and simplifying that down. So in that case, you have no cross products, which is nice. Or in this case, you've got A cross B cross C cross D, Okay, well, you can simplify it down so that there's only one cross product in there um, in each term. Okay, that makes it a lot uh, easier to deal with. Okay, so um, let's get rid of that. So the next thing we're going to talk about here is the separation vector. This is notoriously confusing. Um, and the why is it confusing? I don't know. Everything's confusing. So let's say you have a charge sitting in space. What is our job in ENM? We want to calculate the field that this charge generates. Let's define where it is in some coordinate system. So our first thing we have to do is define a coordinate system and then say this charge is located at that vector r. Okay, So that's the position vector. So now let's say we want to say, well, what's the strength of the field out in this part? Okay, um, That is the field point vector. That is where you want to calculate your effect of this charge. What we care about, and you do this, you did this in class up to now, is you want to say that I've got a charge here and I want to calculate its field strength there. Okay, Nor so in one dimension that was easy. I just said the charge is here and I say measure it a distance uh, two meters away. And you say, oh, Q1 over R squared or whatever. Um, and you calculate what that is. Well, that's a very juvenile or sophomoric um, way to calculate the... Um, uh, strength of a field in a very nice coordinate system that was given to you very politely. In this case, we have to define our coordinate system and say that this uh, charge is located at that point specifically, and then we have another, uh, we want to know what's happening over at that point. Okay, 
in Griffiths, um, he defines that separation vector um, with this script R that nobody on the planet Earth can recreate. Okay, so I cannot, there's no font that has that. So why he did that makes him a jerk, um, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Okay, so um, I call it R sub S for script R. And all script R is, the magnitude of script R is just, if this is R, um, if this is R prime, and this is R, then um, this vector is the same as R minus R prime. That's just the definition. If you have two vectors and you want to know this, you can say vector R plus script R is equal to R, sorry, um, he, he does it backwards, so R prime. Okay, there's R prime. Let me erase this. So this is R prime, this is script R, and this is R. Okay, well, we know that R prime, we know that R prime plus script R is equal to R, because that's how vectors work. So that means script R is equal to R minus R prime. Okay, so that's all this is saying. And that's all he's saying in the book there. Uh, oh, that's the end of that. Okay, so then what you care about, and let's go make this bigger, um, what you care about here is you've got some source point, you've got some field point, source point, field point, okay? And uh, you want to calculate, uh, let's say you've got some charge Q here and you want to know what's the force on some other charge Q over there. So what you care about is how far apart they are. How far apart are these? Well, it's if you know what R prime is and you know what R is, then how far apart they are is just r minus r prime. Okay, so um, r is the field location, and the length of r is just the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Okay, so that's um, the position vector, not a big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, another way to uh, define what direction r points is the vector r divided by its magnitude. So what what is this doing? Um, R hat just points in the direction of R. So it's going to have, um, you can think about it this way. It's going to have a length of 1, and it's going to point in the direction of R. So then what you're going to have is this R times that vector. Okay, so little r, no bold or anything, times R hat. So that's the magnitude of the vector, and that's the direction of the vector. Okay, why is that important? Because when you've got a coordinate system like this and your object is over here and it's got some vector pointing in that direction, um, a unit vector normally has you know, one, a length of one in the x direction or a length of one in the y direction or z direction or whatever. But this unit vector is going to have a length of one, but it's going to point in some arbitrary direction. So how do you figure out, how do you normalize it, how do you make it length one and also have a direction. Well, this is how. You take your vector r, which has components x in the x direction, y in the y direction, z in the z direction, and you divide by its length. Okay, that's going to give you an average amount in the x direction, an average amount in the y direction, and an average amount in the z direction. So you just take your actual r vector, which has x component, y component, z divided, and you divide it by its length. Okay, and that gives you uh, a vector which has length 1, and points in some off dimension direction. Okay, R could be, it could, this could end up being, you know, um, uh, one x hat. Okay, it could, and then zero y and zero z. It could point along an axis. Um, the next thing you care about is uh, this displacement vector here, the infinitesimal displacement vector. So sometimes we want to say we're pointed in the R hat direction, but then sometimes we want to say, um, we're going to start to move this direction a little bit. Uh, so if you want to go from some location x, y, z to some slight other location x plus dx, y plus dy, z plus dz, you're going to have some vector um, like that, and you want to move this vector to there. So you're going to have to point um, your vector, you're going to have to move it over a little bit into a new location. So you want to move it a little bit in the x direction, a little bit in the y direction, and a little bit in the z direction. Um, you could call that dr because you're going to change dr just a little bit. Um, but uh, um, you know, sometimes we, you'll see when we need to do this. 
Okay, so in electrodynamics, you frequently encounter problems involving two points, your source point, R prime, where the charge is located, and the field point, R, where you're trying to calculate um, the electromagnet or a magnetic field. So we have this um, script R, which is just R minus R prime, like I talked about. Its magnitude is just written as that, and how do you find that? Is you subtract them and then do the square root of the new component, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The unit vector pointing in that direction, um, r hat, is again the same thing. It's the actual vector script r divided by its magnitude. That will normalize each of the components to point in that direction. So how do you do that? What is this, oh, sorry, what is script r itself? Um, if you have one vector and another vector, then this vector that joins those two together um, is x minus x prime hat in the x hat direction, y minus y prime y hat, and then plus z minus z prime z hat. And then script r without any vector notation, the magnitude of it is the square root of that squared. Okay, so you've got um, each of these uh, components squared and then the square root of that. Okay, and then the unit vector r hat, script r hat, is just um, r, which is all this there, divided by all this on the bottom. So you normalize it to get the components uh, pointing in the right direction. Okay, and then um, that's, we're going to do this all the time. We're going to use that all the time. So let's just um, kind of rehash it. So you're going to have some uh, vector here and some vector there. And this is going to say where my charge is, and this is where I want to measure it at. So what I care about is how far apart they are. Okay, so how do I calculate how far apart they are? That's what this is. That separation vector points from um, that separation vector points from this point over to that point, which means it has this x component, that y component, and whatever z component. Okay, and you can calculate what that is in terms of the other two vectors, r and r prime, um, doing this algorithm. So we're going to talk uh, a lot more about that um, as we go along. Okay, so um, you'll want to do problem 1.7. We're going we're to do that together. Okay, so then section 1.1.5, I said we're going to just skip through this. It's just talking about how vectors transform. So you want to go from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. How do the components change as you rotate the coordinate system? And there's just an algorithm for that. Um, and uh, it looks like this. And this angle phi is the angle between the two coordinate systems. Um, and so your new components, a, y, bar, a, z, bar, are equal to the original components with this transformation. So you do cosine phi times a, y plus sine phi, a, z, um, and that becomes your new y hat component, a, y component. And generally, you have an arbitrary three-dimensional thing. You've got this tensor notation, and you get into there um, when we talk about general relativity or something like that. But for this class, we'll never have to do that, okay? Um, so that is section 1.1, and I will see you guys uh, next time.